Hey guys, thanks for joining us online today. We are so glad that you stopped by to see what God's doing here at Family Church. Now, if this message or any other message that you've listened to has changed your life in any way, we want to hear about it. So email us at changedlife at familychurch.tv. Now, if you'd like to become a deeper part of what God's doing here at Family Church, you can help out by giving online. Just go to our homepage, click on the Give tab, and follow the instructions. Thanks again for joining us today. If you have your Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to be reading a few verses from there in just a moment. Before we jump in, though, I want to say this. Here's, here's what I've had in my mind all week. God is working to get you over whatever Satan is currently in this moment right now using to try and drag you under. See, his strategies change over time. And so God is working right now in this moment to get you over whatever Satan is currently using to try to drag you under. And I want you to think about that just for a moment. Kind of let that wash over you. Because there's a lot of different people in this room and I can guarantee you that the strategies are all a little bit different um, depending upon kind of where you're at in life. Now, I'm, I'm currently in a series called When Good People Make Bad Choices, and today will be the last teaching in this series. I hope this has really helped you, and we're going to move on into some other stuff for the summertime. Um, last week, Bill Sharpless was here, and Bill always does a great job. And Bill talked about the importance of simply being who God created you to be because that's your ministry. And I just loved, I just loved the way that he articulated that. And, and um, God really spoke to me that day. And um, he mentioned, Bill mentioned the word passion and how that our passions can not only create a life that is fulfilling, but can also be used to attract others to Christ. And he was absolutely right, Okay. So I want to build on that today because the right passions keep your life pointed toward God, but the wrong passions can actually move you away from God and the future that God has planned for you. And so what we need to do is get our passions right. Are you with me? Have you ever had wrong passions that have steered you in a wrong direction? We all have. And so this morning we're going to talk a lot about getting our passions right and making sure that our passions are pointing us toward God. And, and today we're going to talk about another bad choice that a lot of really good people make. And that's the choice of letting down your spiritual guard. And so I want to start this morning with a question. Was there a time in your life when you were more spiritually guarded Was there a time in your life when you were more spiritually guarded? Well, what does letting your spiritual guard look like in the life of a strong follower of Christ? Now, I think the best way for me to explain this is to take you into a Bible story. So we're going into 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. Again, we're talking about what does it look like when someone who loves God, has a passion for God, is pursuing God, begins to pull back and begins to let down their spiritual guard. What does that look like in the life of someone who loves God? 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1 says this. It says, in the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. Now, um, Rabbah was the capital city of the Ammonites. The name Rabbah actually means great city, and it also means prosperous people. And so Joab wasn't just out there fighting a bunch of weaklings. They were out there fighting some serious, serious contenders. And the scripture says that they destroyed the people of, of Ammon. Now I want you to look at the last part of that verse because that is so important. The last part of that verse says, but David remained in Jerusalem. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now look at verse 2. 
One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, I want to just stop right there. We're going to talk a little bit about this story. The woman in this story, of course, is a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And the man in the story is King David. Now, here's what we know. We know that King David is described as being a man after God's own heart. And yet, at the same time, he is watching his married neighbor take a bath. Those two things do not go together. <laughs> Have you ever heard that song? One of these things is not like the other. Right? <laughs> How many of you know one of these things is not like... Okay, the other. Yeah, I, you don't want me to sing. No. I'll spare you. Here we have this man after God's own heart. A man who wrote the Psalms. A man who, who obviously we read about over and over in, in the book of 1 and 2 Samuel, the giant killer. We have David, this, this, this grand champion for God. And yet at the same time, he's out on the roof of his palace watching his married neighbor take a bath. I think that we can safely say that David let his spiritual guard down that night. Can we all safely say that? His spiritual guard was down. And the interesting thing about this story is that David should not have even been there. And we read about it in verse 1. It was, it was the spring of the year. And typically David, who, who was the king of Israel, would have been out fighting. But instead of, of being out fighting, he chose to stay home. And, and there's a great lesson in that. And here's the lesson. David's decision to no longer engage the enemy in battle opened a door for the enemy to invade his life. I want to say that again. David's decision to no longer engage the enemy in battle opened a door for the enemy to invade his life. And that's why we, we have got to keep battling in prayer. That's why we have to keep battling in the word. That's why we have to keep battling just by, just by being here. Don't stay home while the rest of us go to battle. Refuse to remain in Jerusalem. Show up and fight. <laughs> One of the things that has me a little concerned, and I'm just going to be honest about it, we know the, the merge took place nine months ago. I've been officially the pastor of Family Church and Real Life Church for nine months this week. And we have, we have this little app on our phone, and it's called the People app that the staff and I have. And so you can go into the People app, and it will tell you all kinds of information about the congregation. It will tell you um, um, what percentage of people are a certain age. For example, you know, people from 12 to 18, it, tell, it tells me what percentage of the congregation is, is that age. Um, it tells me uh, how many women we have here. It tells me how many men we have here. And there's 124 people here that don't know what they are. <laughs> They're in the category with a question mark. Hey, we're just glad you're here and we're going to help you figure this out. <laughs> but one of the things that really concerns me is that when you go to the People app, it will tell you, it changes every week. It, the number changes every week because every week it will tell you how many people are actively engaged in family church. So that means how many people actually belong here. You, they come here, they serve here, they're a part of here. And I know that we go in from time to time and, and we clean it out so that it isn't just, you know, one of those situations where... A church has 10,000 members, um, but it only runs 50, and 7,000 of those people are dead. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? 
So it's not one of those situations. It is the, the people app. It tells us who is engaged here, who is involved here, who comes here, who shows up for battle here at Family Church. And so you want to know how many is on the number today? It changed, it changed, in fact, since yesterday. But I'll tell you how many people is on the number today. 1,398. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. But what's the number today? Jason, what's the number today? Do we have it? 421. Okay. Wait. I thought... I thought it was 1398. And one of the things that concerns me about the culture here is that we have a lot of people that are only showing up about once every two months. We have to show up for the battle. We have to decide not to remain in Jerusalem. And don't get me wrong, I am glad you're here. Thank God for you. Thank God you're here. Thank God for those that are watching online. And I know that some Sunday mornings, it's a battle. You have to battle with your kids to get here. You have to sometimes battle with yourself to get here. You have to battle with your schedule to get here. But listen, it's a battle worth fighting. And so battle to be here. One of the first things that David did to get himself in that place was he just stopped showing up to fight. And so we need to battle to be here and when we, when we get here, we need to be battling. We need to be battling in worship and prayer and receiving the word and building relationships and life with one another because the thing that ruined David in the very beginning was he just stopped fighting. Have you stopped fighting? Was there a time when, you know, getting up in the morning and reading some scripture and getting some word into you was really important, but you just really don't fight that fight anymore? Or maybe there, were, there was a time when you felt more connected or closer to God or closer to your church, but you just don't really fight that fight anymore. Well, the first thing that happened to David as his spiritual guard was lowering was he just stopped fighting. You got to fight. Think with me for a minute about David's battle resume. I was thinking about that this week. He had killed tens of thousands of Philistines. Remember the song that the women used to sing about David? Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. How come the women around here don't write songs about me? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> we, yeah, we don't need those kind of songs, okay? <laughs> Think about his battle resume. Think about, remember who he killed? Yes. Who? Goliath. Goliath. He killed Goliath. He was more than a king. He was a super soldier. Listen, guys. The devil is not impressed with heaps of dead Philistines. The devil doesn't care if you keep the bloody head of a giant that you just killed in your backpack like David did. <laughs> did you know that? <laughs> it's like, what you got in your pack? You don't want to know. The devil doesn't care how many Philistines you've killed. The devil doesn't care how many giants you've killed. He just needs you to take a break from fighting. That's what he needs. So that he can get in your life. The enemy doesn't care if you used to be a pastor. He doesn't care if you used to lead worship. He doesn't care if you used to be a spiritual heavy hitter. Your spiritual resume means nothing to him. Just like with David, the devil is offering you a hiatus. He's saying, take a break. He's saying, let down your guard. He's saying, you no longer have to fight. Listen, you never get to the place where you get to stop fighting. 
You never get to that place. You never get to the place where you don't need to be here on Sunday morning. You never get to that place. Well, Pastor Larry, you... No, listen. There is no... Pastor Larry, you don't understand. Amen. There you go. <laughs> when you let down your spiritual, spiritual guard, bad things are going to happen to you. Amen. That God does not want to happen to you. Because he loves you. But as your guard comes down, the enemy comes in. So what should you do? Number one. Number one, what should you do? Number one, refuse to relax your convictions. The things that used to matter to you should still matter to you. So here's what happens in the story. David, David sees Bathsheba um, bathing. And, and honestly, I'm not sure he could have avoided doing that. But he could have avoided what came next. He could have decided not to let his spiritual guard down. And here's why. Just like in the Garden of Eden, the problem usually isn't what the devil shows you. It's what you do with, the devil, with what the devil shows you. So what would David do? Verse 3. It says, And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So instead of putting her out of his mind, David begins gathering information. So at this point, here's what David knows. He knows two things. Number one, he knows that Bathsheba is married and that she's married to Uriah. He knows that. The second thing that David knows, he knows the seventh commandment as found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. The seventh commandment is this. You shall not commit adultery. Okay? So David knows those two things. He knows that Bathsheba is married. And he knows the seventh commandment. He is at a crossroads. And it's the same crossroads that you and I often find ourselves in. Do we follow our convictions and, and, and what will make God happy? Or do we let down our guard and do what our flesh is persuading us to do? So what would David do? Verse 4. Verse 4 says, Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. And so what did David do? Well, David obviously um, had sex with Bathsheba. Now, Bathsheba's husband was more than just a soldier. Uriah was a member of David's personal bodyguard. And in fact, he was with the troops that Joab had just led out to battle. And so Uriah was fighting the war that David had stayed home from. And so as always, when we let down our spiritual guard, there will, there will be consequences. And we find consequences in verse 5. Verse 5 says, The woman conceived... And sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. And that leads us to our next point. Relaxed convictions always give birth to a disaster. And so as you read the story, we're not going to read all of it for time's sake this morning because we're trying to get to the end. But as you read the story, David panicked. And, and as you look at David, he's going to teach us a valuable lesson. And that lesson is when you do something that you're ashamed of, don't make it worse by trying to fix it your way instead of God's way. Because your way will make it worse. But God's way can fix even the dumb things you do. And the dumb things that I do. So we're going, to learn, we're going to learn a lesson this morning from David. David, at this point, could have pulled the plug on the building volcano. But he didn't. His life teaches us that when you relax your convictions, you will end up anything but relaxed. And so, as you keep reading, David is now convinced that God can't fix it, but that he can fix it. And so what did he do? Verse 6. So David sent this word to Joab. 
Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Isn't David such a nice guy? Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace. And a gift from the king was sent with him. So David, David sent, sent Uriah home to relax. He even, he even sent some food. And we found out later that he would even send some wine. And he was hoping that, that Uriah would sleep with Bathsheba. And the whole thing would be over. But Uriah did something unexpected in verse 9. Verse 9 says, But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. If you keep reading, David confronts him and Uriah reminds David that the armies of Israel were camped out in the open field and that he wasn't about to go home and eat and drink and sleep with his wife. And then the story only gets worse. The next thing that David does is he tries to get Uriah drunk. And he thinks that if he gets him drunk, he will go home and he will sleep with Bathsheba. But once again, Uriah won't go home. Now get this. At this point, a drunken Uriah had more morals than a sober David. A drunken Uriah had more morals than a sober David. So look what happened next. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fierce. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. And that's exactly what happened. David thought it was over. But it wasn't over. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 27 it says this. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And then the story continues to unfold. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1 it says the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now let me tell you a little bit about what Nathan said. I'm just going to kind of give you the cliff notes. Nathan was a prophet. And he was a trusted advisor to David. And so God sent Nathan to David with a story. And the prophet told David a story about two men. A story that goes like this. He said there were two men. One was very rich and had a very large number of sheep and cattle. The other man was poor and he had nothing but one little lamb that he loved. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. To him, that lamb was like a daughter. One day a traveler came to the rich man and instead of taking one of his own sheep to prepare a meal for the traveler, he took the lamb of the poor man and prepared it instead. At this, David became furious and he said, As surely as the Lord lives, this man deserves to die. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. <laughs> Can you see David's jaw dropping? And he was thinking to myself, himself, oh no, it's not over. I can see his eyes getting big and he's thinking to himself, oh no, it's not over. Now, I want to move forward with the story because it's important that you remember two things. Number one, David did suffer consequences, okay? He did suffer consequences. Um, the consequences were, were severe. The scripture says that the sword never left his house. He, he, he couldn't get along with his kids after this happened. Um, and it says that the child that Bathsheba was pregnant with died, okay? Now, that's the bad part. We're going to get to the good part. And here's the good part. Okay, or we're going to get to the good part, I, I guess, as we keep going. Here's what we know. When we let down our spiritual guard, when we relax our convictions, we, we're usually stuck in a moment without thinking about what the outcome is going to be. 
right? Like we get stuck in this moment where we're thinking about what's happening right now, but we're not thinking about what, what the outcome is going to be down the road. And I think that that's where David was. And here's, here's why I think that. Think about, think about David for a minute. David, David was the king, and so he obviously had a couple things going on, okay? Number one, as the king, David, David had a vast harem of women. So why would he feel the need to sleep with his married neighbor? I mean, the odds of all of his wives being mad at him all at once are pretty slim, Scott. If you just have one wife, that's a good argument. He would have had multiple wives at home. Not, not, not only multiple wives, but I was, I was thinking about this on Friday. Bathsheba was beautiful. But remember, David was married to Abigail. Some of you are like, so what? Abigail was famous for being the most beautiful woman in the land. So not only did, did David have multiple wives, but David was married to Abigail, who was famous for her rare beauty. So what he received from Bathsheba, he had at home. There is no logical reason for David to do what he did other than he let down his spiritual guard. And here's the thing. This entire thing could have been avoided if David had kept his spiritual guard up the night he first saw her. He should have turned around that night and went the other way. Instead, he did three things. Number one, he watched her. Number two, he looked her up on Facebook to see who she was. <laughs> he sent messengers to find out who, remember? And they came back and said, this is, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So she's out there. Now, you know, she's out there. She's on, she's on the roof. If David could see her, obviously she could see him. And so, you know, she wasn't innocent in the, the story either. So the first thing he, he did was he watched her. The second thing that he did was he looked her up on Facebook to see who she was. And then the third thing that he did was he invited her over. And there's, here's the lesson. What you do when the enemy first entices you to let down your spiritual guard is very important. What you do when the enemy first entices you. The entire time, God was sending little clues of rescue, but David just kept marching towards the edge of the cliff until eventually he fell over, right? And so let me ask you a question this morning. What's God warning you about right now? Do you have areas where your spiritual guardrails are not what they used to be? Well, the good news is after the damage was all over, there were a few positive things that happened. Out of all of this situation, David wrote Psalm 51. And I'll just read it really fast. Psalm 51 says, this is David, and this is right after all this happened, and, and David is finally... Um, aware of what he's done and he's talking to God and, and he says in Psalm 51 and verse 1, he says, have, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time of my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Look at verse seven. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
And then verse 10 is the most famous verse probably um, in this chapter. David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You read that verse and you realize that this man after God's own heart had let his, his guard down and he needed to be renewed. And so one good thing that came out of this was, was, was um, Psalm 51. Another good thing that ended up coming out of all this, David, David did eventually marry Bathsheba. And you might have heard of their next son. He was a guy by the name of Solomon. Anybody hear of him? Aren't you glad that God can even take those broken, messed up things that we do and use them? for future good. So when it comes to your spiritual guard, what should you do? Two things. Well, maybe just one thing. No, two things. We're going to talk about two things. Refuse to remain in Jerusalem. You have to show up to, to the fight. If you feel like your spiritual guard is slipping, that's when you need to be pressing in even more. That's when you're battling to be here. That's when you're battling to be in the word. That's when you're battling to pray, even if you don't feel like it. So you, you have to show up to fight. You can't remain in Jerusalem. And the second thing, if you feel like your spiritual guard is, is slipping... Number two, listen early and often. David should have listened early when he had red flags, when the Holy Spirit was warning him, when he knew that what he was about to do was going to go against God and go against God's word. He should have listened early and he should have listened often, but he didn't. And that's what got this man after God's own heart in trouble. And if it can happen to David, then how many of you know it could happen to us? So fight, listen early, listen often. Now, I want to do, in our last five minutes, I want to do this. I think this is important. And we're, we're going to have these available for you right after service if you would like them. I'm going to, real quickly, I'm going to go through 10 things that you can do to, to avoid having an affair. Okay? This is what happened to David. David let his spiritual guard down and he had an affair with Bathsheba. And these are things, these 10 things, I, I took them right out, of, right out of my book, When Good People Make Bad Choices. And so you can get them there or you can get them for free um, today or we can email them to you. So let's go through these real quick, okay? Number one, we're talking about avoiding an affair. Number one, refuse to be alone with someone who has expressed sexual interest in you. And the verse is Genesis 39 and verse 11. It says, one day, this is talking about Joseph, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. So she caught him talking about Potiphar's wife by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. So number one, refuse to be alone with someone who has expressed sexual interest in you. Number two, avoid prolonged eye contact. Proverbs chapter six and verse 25 says, do not lust in your heart after her beauty and let, or let her captivate you with her eyes. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. Number three, keep the penalty in mind. What will this do to your spouse, your children, your reputation, and etc.? Um, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 29 is the verse that says, So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Okay, so keep the penalty in mind. Number four, be emotionally guarded. Be careful who you reveal intimate details of your life to. And, and that is Song of Solomon chapter 4. It says, How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. That's translated a little rough. Um, how, how much more, <laughs> how, 
How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice? Your lips, look at this, your lips drip with sweetness as honeycomb. My bride, milk and honey are under your tongue. And he's just talking about, you know, the pleasantness of what's coming out of your mouth. So if you are more open to revealing your struggles and revealing um, the vulnerable things about your life uh, to someone of the opposite sex who is not your spouse, then you're going to be more vulnerable to having an affair with that person, okay? So make sure that you're not revealing intimate details of your life regularly to someone of the opposite opposite sex. Number five, foster accountability. The, the verse is 1 Peter 5.4. It says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So if you struggle with this, you might need to uh, get an, an accountability partner or maybe even talk about this with your counselor. Number six, this is one that, um, where did James go? He usually likes these kind of verses. Number six, engage in regular marital sex. <laughs> he, he, would, he would give me a big amen if he were sitting here. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 18 says, May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe and a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captured by her love. In fact, we're even taught that marital sex is an act of worship. And so if he says, hey, let's go worship. (laughs) He may not be talking about prayer. Number seven, devote personal prayer time to your marriage. Ask God to place a hedge of protection around you and your spouse. Job chapter one and verse 10, um, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? And this is Satan talking uh, to God about Job, okay? Number eight, never entertain sexual fantasies about other people. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay? Number nine, this this one is really important, guys. Treat all social media and text messages as if your spouse is going to read them. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you have to password protect your, your phone against your spouse, I would say that you probably have something to hide. Isaiah 29 and verse 15, woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think who sees us, who will know. Okay, now I know that you know, obviously, I'm not saying that you have to reveal everything about your life to your spouse, but you need to treat social media as if they were going to read it, okay? And then finally, number 10 is uh, speak positively about your spouse and refuse to share negative details about your marriage, Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue can bring death and life. Those who love talk will reap the consequences. And so if you're going to talk negatively about your spouse, you probably should do that to God because he can handle it. It's like, dear God, why are they so stupid? (laughs) And God will say, you married him, so... Who's stupider? I don't know. <laughs> Seriously though, how many of you know, we, we, have, we have to take steps. We have to make sure that we're protecting our, 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 our marriage and we're protecting our spouse and we're protecting ourselves. And, and you know, David was a man after God's own heart and yet he, f- he fell into that trap. And, and we don't want you to fall into that trap. So if you'd like a copy of those, we, we will have those available after the service today. But we're going to stop right there. Let's all stand. I know I gave you a lot of information this morning.
But I, but I feel like it was valuable information that you needed. And so we're, we're going to pray. Um, first, let's just pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for this good day. And, and thank you, God, for the people that are here this morning. All, um, I think it was 441 of them or whatever the number was. Lord, I'm so thankful that they showed up today to the fight. That they didn't send Joab. They didn't just decide that today wasn't worth showing up for. But they're here. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for those that are watching online today. Sometimes we can't be here. Sometimes kids are sick. Sometimes job schedules get sideways. Thankful for the people who will watch this tomorrow on the app. But Lord, I, I know this morning that we've got to be careful not to let our spiritual guard down. I think sometimes that happens, especially to those of us that have been in the kingdom for a while. Like David. A man who, who not only killed giants, but a man who, who, who danced before the Ark of the Covenant, who was a, just a man who, who loved you and a man who, who, who wrote many of the verses in our Bibles that we read. And yet at the same time, he was not a perfect man. And Lord, I, I, I just pray today, God, first of all, I pray this morning for those here who, who have already let down their spiritual guard and maybe they're eating the fruit of that right now. And Lord, let them know that, it, that they have the power to stop it at any time. That they have the power to stop it. That Lord, let them know that, that you are a God of restoration, a God of second, third, fourth, and a million chances. You are that God. But at some point we have to come to our senses and begin to make better decisions. And so Lord, I pray for those today that might, might have already let down their spiritual guard and, and I pray, Lord, that you would help them to gather that back up this morning. God, help them to, uh, uh, to, to do what David should have done, to not kill Uriah. He had the power to stop it and they have the power to stop it as well. So I pray for them. And then Lord, I, I pray for, for those here today who, who maybe, maybe their spiritual guard is, is not what it used to be. Maybe, maybe they're still battling, but they're not battling on the same level. Lord, maybe at one time they were, they were just 